Uh, and so I'm from the States, and I'm really glad to, to be here with you today and to share uh, some of our experiences on kind of two levels. And again, my name is Robin, and I've taken off my badge. At the end of this, there's a little bit of contact information, but I'm happy to give you a lot more. Um, so the, the, the two things that, at least the two things that I think we have in common are that we're in an extraordinary moment when uh, a lot of external forces are convincing our citizens who to believe, who not to believe, what's true, what's not true. And so, you know, we talk about fake news or we talk about uh, the Autobots that help drive that. But there are just a tremendous number of forces at work uh, that are kind of changing the conversation and forcing a lot of us who've relied on data, science. I mean, in, in, in the US now, science is partisan. There's really only one party that believes in science, one political party. And then, uh, so there's this kind of big picture kind of what's going on with our citizenry and our, our media channels and how we learn and how we get information out. And then there's a really specific thing of what happens when all of a sudden your whatever you want to call the group of people that you're trying to reach. In my case, it's just citizens. But when they wake up, and so the problem isn't getting people interested. The problem or the challenge is how in the world do we ramp up to be able to capture that momentum of the, the, the interest of regular everyday people who normally are too busy or too stressed or too distracted and now think, I've lost my country, what am I gonna do? Or my country's not going in the right direction, what am I gonna do? So we've got more volunteers than we can handle right now actually. And we're trying to change that because we never wanna not be able to give our volunteers and our interested citizens something to do. Uh, and so what we're calling this today is from autopilot to attack formation, when sleeping citizens awake, which feels like I went a little bit 70s horror movie on this. Um, but it's, well, maybe, maybe there's some truth in that. So uh, the last time this happened on a, on a major scale in America uh, was right before uh, the US entry into World War II. Because we were isolationist, there was a big move to let Europe solve its own problems. I mean, America was not really interested in getting involved. And then, maybe luckily for everybody, Japan attacks the United States. And all of a sudden, this sleeping giant wakes up and gets reinvolved in the world in a new way. And a couple of really important things, people have called it kind of the American century after that because America got so alive, so involved, so connected with other nations and other causes, and got involved, the Victory Gardens, people who couldn't go to war, people who didn't have money, they could do their part by planting Victory Gardens and letting the big farms ship their food to the soldiers or overseas while they would harvest their own. And this has, I think, a lot of parallels with what's happening right now. People who can't or think they can't run for Congress or they don't have money to donate or they don't have this, what is their version of a Victory Garden? What can they do in their backyard or on their balcony or in their kitchen? What can they do? I think that's really key to understanding how we capture the momentum and help motivate these folks. And this has, so is anyone here Japanese? L love the Japanese, God bless you, everyone. Um, in this case, we were super happy when, when Japan surrendered. Uh, it, it felt like we had achieved victory. We had kind of won our com uh, country back and we had one key ally. And the special relationship between Britain and the United States was really key because it, it frankly, it was Churchill, it was the royal family having a, a charm offensive with US leaders that also helped pave the way for us to be involved. And I'll come back to this special uh, relationship before this is over, but I want us to remember that. Okay, so 2016, the Russians attack. And so I, I've simplified a really complex situation that has to deal with voter apathy, with uh, a rise of nationalism, um, smear campaigns, a lot of complexity 
but from the, the narrative that I'm telling right now, the way I'm framing this about sleeping citizens awake, and the last time this really happened was Pearl Harbor, the fact that, that we're looking at an entire presidency that may be suborned by a foreign power is crucial to the fact of why some citizens are awake. This is outside of our experience. And what if it's true? And how do we handle this? Um, and something that's key to this is that although there was a lot of voter apathy and so many people who, who, who were eligible to vote didn't, Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote. But because of the arcane way the, the US handles elections, the so-called electoral college is, is what actually decided it. Um, and so what was going on during the election that triggered our population to wake up? And so I, I, I've subtitled it Trauma Triggering in Trump, but hate crimes in the US rose more than 20% during the election. Hate crimes against people of color, against Muslims, against Jews. A favorite target of white nationalism and other groups, but a favorite target. And so we had the early, early in Trump's campaign, when it was still just, uh, you know, kind of the Republican intramural rugby matches, uh, he, he talked about people from Mexico as murderers and rapists, really framing the whole idea of, you know, of an entire population. Islam was demonized, Jews were attacked, white nationalism rose to the extent that it was perfectly acceptable to say, make America white again. Of course, it never was. I mean, there's the whole idea of the genocide to begin with, but you know, back in the 1600s, 1400s, 1500s, all people of color came under fire. Women, personified by Hillary Clinton, were degraded. And, and a kind of a hatred of women, particularly from other women, arose. And it's one of the most interesting sort of sub-themes that has gone on uh, in America recently. Um, and then when we talk about framing, and, and, and Chris yesterday uh, was, was doing some really good exercises around you know, the quick framing for people to understand. And that's what the Trump campaign was doing. It wasn't Hillary, it was crooked Hillary. Automatic framing of who she was and what she represented. Ted Cruz, Lion Ted. Mario, who was another candidate, Little Mario. So everybody's demeaned, degraded, dismissed. And it triggered a lot of stuff in people who didn't, so it triggered some things that were like, yes, I believe this. I believe Hillary's crooked. I believe the Jews have been against us from the beginning. I believe Mexicans are murderers and rapists. Some people, that's what it triggered. For everybody else, it triggered, oh no. And with Trump personally, it triggered a lot of female outrage. Uh, I have been in several meetings um, recently where, where women have talked about the, the specific assault triggers that happened with Trump and been in, in a room of more than 30 women where everyone, everyone said they were someplace on a spectrum of having been groped, assaulted, raped in their lives. Every one of them had had some experience of that. And he just, he triggered that tremendously. He also triggered the normal reaction. Well, we're gonna flee. We're gonna go, here are John Stewart, Rosie O'Donnell, a whole bunch of people saying, I'm gonna go to Canada. If Trump wins, I'm going to Canada. Uh, my personal choice was New Zealand, because uh, it seems très sportif, and there's good wine and all that. And, and here's, what my, here's what my husband said to me. He said, you may not recognize your white privilege, but what are you gonna do with your white privilege in America? Are you gonna use it to flee to another country where you could probably get a job and we could live all right? Or are you gonna use it on behalf of every other person from every other color and ethnicity who's at risk now? So grateful to my husband for saying that, kept me from going to New Zealand, uh, and, but really awakened in me my responsibility to step up and do something. And we were all dealing with this sort of, it can't happen here, yet it did. And if it happened in the US, where else is it gonna happen? And so people thought Brexit couldn't happen, and yet 
you know, and people, you know, luckily, the, what was the recent election? Was it in Holland? Dutch, the Dutch. And so luckily they kind of fought off a far right candidate. Uh, what's gonna happen with France, you know? Um, but this, uh, have y'all seen this, uh, uh, this graffiti image? Uh, very powerful, it was going on during the campaign and it captured this idea of the collusion of what was going on. And uh, as was made clear earlier this week, the FBI in America and some other organizations have been investigating the Trump campaign for its relationship with Russia since July. Going back to that earlier idea of the special relationship with Britain, Britain's been on the ball long before we were and has been investig investigating the relationship between Trump and Russia since before that. And the so-called Steele dossier uh, by a former member, I think, of MI6 helped trigger America's investigation. So since uh, Mr. Trump has been elected president, government agencies ha have begun to be dismantled. Uh, members of Congress have, have, have um, filed bills that would completely take away the Environmental Protection Agency, that the entire agency would be gone. Crucial staff are not being filled. So, so thousands and thousands of staff positions aren't being filled. The guy who's now our Secretary of State, uh, a role that Hillary Clinton once had, didn't even know Trump. Got that call, he says, out of the blue, Rex Tillerson of ExxonMobil. And rather than going to NATO on his next trip, he's gonna go to Russia. Um, so one of my favorite, so when I say favorite, the travel ban's not my favorite, but the, the travel ban that was one of Trump's first executive orders targeted um, people from certain Muslim countries. Not Muslim countries where he had business dealings, where he had hotels and such, but other Muslim countries. And although it was called the travel ban, it was clear who was being banned. And I love this sign that somebody wrote on a piece of cardboard outside of an airport. I think this is at LaGuardia Airport in New York. First they came for the Muslims and we said, not today, motherfucker. And that kind of sums up this resistance movement that has just erupted all over the United States. Um, and then this one, I, I've been calling uh, the, the, uh, one of the nicknames for the Republican Party in America is the GOP, the Grand Old Party. And I, some people have been referring to the GOP as uh, like the Vichy GOP, that they're now complicit. And uh, scholars of European history tell me I should look more to like Czechoslovakia or the uh, Austrian Anschluss, actually, for a, for a better comparison. But this is their logo. This is the logo of the Republicans in America, and it's not fascism when we do it. Okay, so will we flee or will we fight? So for millions and millions of women and men around the world, it was some form of fighting. We're not gonna flee. And so the, the Women's March uh, began uh, right like the, maybe the morning after the election. Uh, a, a woman out in Hawaii said, I can't bear this. And she reached out to people. And all of a sudden there were three women. And then there were 12 and then 100 and then 1,000. And uh, so all across the globe, on the day after, on January 21st, the day after Trump was inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States, millions of people marched. Some marched in protest of Trump. Uh, some marched reestablishing their own values and saying, here's what I stand for. So the Houston Women's March. Houston is the fourth largest city in America. Uh, the greater metropolitan statistical area is about six million. So it goes New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston. Sometimes Chicago and Houston duke it out for third and fourth. Um, the most diverse city in America uh, based on ethnicity, where you've come from, which people group you, you identify with, and uh, more than 100 languages spoken throughout the city. We were not gonna have a women's march. We don't really have good public transportation. We're not a marchy, protesty kind of city. Uh, we're more sort of a work it out, get it done kind of city. 
and everyone was either going to Austin, the capital of Texas, or to Washington, D.C. And 12 days before January 21st, a colleague of mine said, oh, come on, you gotta do this. You gotta have a march in Houston. So, so I volunteered to host it. And um, so 12 days out, I, I contacted them and said, I'll host, here, here I am. Uh, 11 days, we contacted City Hall, and within that time frame, 400 people had found us. How? Well, so the Women's March had a big map. I don't know if you guys saw this, but they had a map of the world. And every time they had a certified, legitimate march plan in, a, in what they were calling a sister city, not Washington, D.C., they put a pin on the map. And that grew to more than 650, more than 650 cities around the world, some of them tiny, some of them, well, I mean, every continent, except, I guess, Antarctica had one. Uh, but more than 650, and just millions and millions of people. They went ahead um, and, and just gave me instant credentials. And so immediately, after, after our conversation, they put a pin on the map for Houston. So that was all it took in the first 24 hours to get 400 people. I didn't do anything except say that I would host it. And 400 people immediately overnight signed up. So 11 days out, we contacted City Hall, began the process for you know, holding a rally, doing a, a free speech march. And um, then the next day uh, was a work day, actually. I did almost nothing for the march. And all of a sudden, we had 900 marchers. Then nine days out, I started contacting people and made this crazy decision that I wasn't going to go to people I'd already worked with on projects like this. I was just going to spread the word and see who raised a hand. Because I figured whoever would say, at, at about nine days out, whoever would say, yeah, I can help you put together this march, really cared about it. And so the steering committee became people I'd never met in my life, but who all cared about this common goal. And as I look back on it, I think, huh, that was a pretty smart thing to do. At the time, it felt really scary, though. But what it did is the people who came to the table had a real vested interest in making it happen. So eight days out, we've got <laughs> me and two team members, but now we're up to 2,500 marchers. A week away, we had our first team meeting with a couple more folks, and you can see how it goes. Six days out, we launched GoFundMe because we had to pay for all of what we were doing. And so on the day of the march, more than 23,000 marchers, and we'd raised $38,000 to pay for expenses. I think if we'd had a vision there then of where we were gonna go, we would have raised more money and gotten more money. Because everyone was like, let's get this done, let's do it. And so, um, this picture, so these two pictures are from Houston. And this picture at the bottom of this, this was a family. One of the interesting things is we had lots of three and four generation families come. People bringing grandchildren, great grandchildren. One of the people who spoke at our rally was a woman who had been very involved in civil, uh, civil rights in the 60s. And she said, why are we having to do this all over again? I thought we'd, I thought we'd fought this. I thought we'd won this. Um, but this family loved Trump's hate and this sign, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. I'm changing the things I cannot upset. And that's what kind of coalesced among people. Um, and so millions of people in, in, in cities across America, and, and so right now I'll just come back to America, marching for things like equality, health care, you know, justice in various levels, and millions of newly activated citizens asking what's next. And when we got home the day after the rally, I just wanted to put my feet up and have some champagne and maybe take a nap. And then my email started going off. And it was people from the rally saying, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to change the world. I'm ready to get a new congressman. I'm ready to, you know, what do I do? How do I ensure that my child grows up in a better world than I do? I mean, really, really extraordinary. Um, and so at that moment, uh, we realized we had a movement, not a march. And so I sent an email to all those people, all these, so, so some of you will have some questions about behind the scenes stuff. Action Networks in the US gave us pro bono the use of their uh, software platform, which allows you to post events and then uh, take RSVPs for them, maintain a mailing list. So, you know, basic, basic online advocacy. 
And because of this, we, had, we suddenly had sort of a verified database and mailing list of people we knew wanted to take action because they had just signed up and marched with us. And so I emailed them and said, uh, this is uh, not a march, this is a movement. The, the march isn't over, it's just beginning. And stay tuned because we're gonna do the following things at the local, state, and federal level. I really didn't know what we were gonna do, but I knew we were gonna do something. And so that was kind of my placeholder to make sure people knew we were gonna go forward. Since then, we've had a meeting with a, a member of the US Congress, uh, I mean a town hall, a thousand, almost a thousand people coming to a town hall, more than a thousand registering. Uh, we've had a volunteer action meetup, and we are mobilizing people around uh, a couple of different areas. Uh, and the number one thing, so you know, everybody has a pet issue, whether it's healthcare, and I don't mean pet in a dismissive way, but you know, something from the heart. So for some people it's healthcare, some people it's education, some people uh, it's, it's uh, equal rights for all or, or human rights. Um, but what everybody has said is, if we can't get people to vote, we're never gonna change who's in office, and then we're never gonna change things about immigration or equality, or things like this. And so voting has become the number one thing that we're gonna do as an organization. We're gonna do other stuff as well, but trying to educate people and get out the vote. And it's particularly crucial because Texas is among the most populous states in uh, the United States, and we are bottom of the barrel in voting participation. So 25 million people live in Texas, about 16 million are eligible to vote. Of those 16 million that are eligible to vote, do you care to guess how many people voted in the last big election for governor in Texas? One. One million people voted. Uh, it's, it's slightly more than one, but it's one point you know, zero something. And 600,000 people cast the vote for the governor of Texas, who is not interested in a lot of the things that everybody else would like to prioritize. He's interested in holding a convention of the 50 states and rewriting the US Constitution. He's interested in a border wall, like Trump is. 600,000 people. I'm rounding, obviously, it was a little bit more than that. Um, if, if all of our 16 million had voted, maybe we would have a different governor now whose interests might be more aligned with the population. Um, urban areas in Texas tend to be blue with, with some red. Rural areas tend to be red with some blue. And so that red-blue indicates it started out being Democrat at Republican, now it's sort of progressive conservative with, with blue being progressive and red being uh, conservative. Uh, there's a lot of things that get in the way of voting in America. There's gerrymandering. Uh, does that go on outside of the US? Districts redrawn so that somebody stays in power or that we put all the Pakistanis in one area and you know all the white people in another. Um, apathy, gridlock, habits. Uh, one of those is cultural, I'll get to that in a minute. The Voting Rights Act was partially overturned. It was one of the big, yeah. Um, thank you for stopping me and asking. So uh, gridlock in, in this specific sense is when the two political parties, so we're not fortunate to have a bunch of political parties and a shared you know, parliamentary style government. It's two big ones, a couple of small ones, and those big ones are right now just butting heads. And very little is getting done because Republicans don't wanna be seen to be cooperating or compromising with Democrats. And right now, Democrats are angry enough. Democrats are usually the touchy-feely ones. Oh, we'll cooperate. Uh, but this time, they're really not that interested. So that's what gridlock is. Uh, one of the, the most important things to come out of the civil rights movement in America in the 1960s was the, was the Voting Rights Act. And that's been partially overturned. And in fact, Texas is one of the states that's on the hook right now uh, to change some of its laws and practices because it has done some things that make it harder for minorities which in Texas, Texas is quickly becoming a majority minority state. So more people of color than white European. Um, but they've made it harder for people of color to vote. Um, and this majority minority population is growing more progressive. Um, so 
what are we as the, the Houston Women's March or Houston Women March going to do about it? Um, frankly, and this, I realize this is an audacious goal, but if you're going to have a goal, you might as well just go for it. Um, if we could revolutionize Houston, double the number of people who go to the polls, which because our voting is so low, our percentage is so low, doubling it is actually statistically possible. We could double and still have room. But if we did that in Houston, it would change the map in terms of who's sent to Congress and, and who's sent to the, to the State House to govern statewide. And if we could do that, there would be a spillover effect. And if we, so if we can change Houston, it's big enough that we can change Texas. And if we can change Texas, then the map of the United States looks different and the governing the people who govern will look different if Texas looks different. So we see it as really strategic opportunity to do something audacious and big and, you know. Um, so I've kind of talked about why Houston is uniquely situated for this and about low voter turnout. Some of it is cultural. A lot of our uh, immigrants, and Houston's very welcoming uh, for immigrant communities, a lot of them have come from places where they couldn't vote, barriers to voting, they're not in the habit of voting. And although they love America and feel kind of patriotic about it all, it's just not ingrained. And then there's a generational thing where grandparents are voting, grandchildren largely aren't. I mean, Obama was a little bit of a blip in that population. But so to some degree, the, the younger you get, the fewer voters we have. Um, so, so, so that's cultural and generational, sleepy. So back to this sleeping citizens awake, a lot of people just thought, oh, it's gonna be okay. One guy said to me two weeks ago, he said, I just thought, I figured Obama's competent, he's got it under control, I don't need to do anything. Apathy, it, oh, it doesn't matter. Same saying, meaning the parties are the same. Well, one thing we've learned is that actually the parties aren't the same, but there was that. And then um, MVDM is my vote doesn't matter. In a world of millions of people, how can one person's vote matter? Uh, and so barriers to voting, barriers for new people voting. So I'm not talking about necessarily just like these voting acts restrictions, but the barriers to actually changing that mindset. And so people aren't educated about voting. They don't know that it's easy and it can be quick. And if you just think about it ahead of time, you know, you can do it in advance. They don't know who their trusted sources were, are because of the attack on credibility and, and journalism. Um, then with timing and locations, we don't have enough locations, they're not open long enough. The, you know, and then this sort of on-demand thinking. One of the crises that we have with the march is the on-demand thinking that millions of people marched, so now Trump's not gonna be president, right? We, we, we knitted pink hats, we made signs, we said we love our neighbors. You know, so, so what's happening with, you know, Trump's still there. And he's doing things every day, or his staff is, his administration is, that are hurting us and hurting our neighbors. Uh, so, but in the midst of this crisis, we've got a huge opportunity. And so, so earlier I said there's about six million people in the greater metropolitan area. So what if we could have a conversation? So out of those six million, women are slightly more than half. What if we could reach one in three women in the greater Houston area in the next 18 months? In November, in November of 2018 will be our next big election where we'll be electing people that'll go to Washington or Texas or wherever. In 18 months, can we reach one in three women? This year is the 40th anniversary of the only ever national women's conference where the 50 states sent female delegates to Houston, of all places, Houston, for a national women's convention. And if you look back at the minutes from uh, 40 years ago, you see that they're dealing with the same things we're dealing with today. Uh, by the way, my husband uh, gave me a replica pen today that the suffragettes wore. And so I'm kind of proudly standing in solidarity today with that. So Houston is decided, d d um, divided up into super neighborhoods uh, sort of to handle geopolitical stuff in Houston. And 
we think, in our audacious thinking, that if we can have a conversation with a million women about voting, that we can get 150,000 new voters, and that we can do this in 18 months, and that we can, um, we can, we can turn around what's going on. Uh, right now, it's, the, the, the march is purely volunteer in Houston at this moment. We are, cre we are be becoming a nonprofit. I don't know what our final structure will be. I don't know if we'll have paid staff or if we'll continue to be volunteer-led. There's a lot of passion in a volunteer-led organization, but there's not as much accountability or it's a different kind of accountability. You guys know all those issues. Um, and really, I think, crucial for us is that we want this to be a human-to-human -human campaign supported by digital which kind of flips on its head some of the other things, some of the other ways we've done things. But we want in-person conversations, in-person actions, uh, who lives me, who, does, who doesn't live near me. Texas has the highest percentage of gated communities in America. Keep themselves in to keep other people out. And uh, I'm going to, maybe in the question time, come back to, to these things because I want to know, if you had 18 months, what would you do? <laughs>